Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford, back today with another video on my channel, usually dedicated to Norse myth and language, but often taking side quests into the bigger picture of Indo-European languages, especially with the series of shorts that I've been doing about Indo-European roots and the monthly check-ins on Indo-European studies news with Professor Tony Yates. So today I want to talk about a kind of a meta question that often comes up in these discussions, or rather in the kind of comments and questions I get about these discussions, which is how Proto-Indo-European is represented on the page or on your screen. Of course, this is a language that was not written down by its speakers, or if it was, I mean, it's highly unlikely, but uh, we have no trace of it. So how are we representing it in writing? Well, there's a few differences, you know, just like Old Norse, a language that was written by its speakers, uh, gets represented in different ways by modern editors. There are some differences in how people write Proto-Indo-European, but also some common conventions. So I want to especially talk about the ones that I use, which I think are most usual in the present day world of Indo-European studies. So first things first, of course, all citations of Proto-Indo-European words or roots should be preceded by an asterisk. This is a convention of linguistics. We always write words, roots, whatever, in reconstructed languages with asterisks preceding them. That indicates that this is not a form actually attested in writing by someone who spoke this language natively. Asterisks are also used in other contexts in linguistics, for example, in showing incorrect sentences that are used in examples. So an English sentence like, me watch the snow would be preceded by an asterisk in some linguistics context just to show that this is not something a native speaker would say. All right, so our roots in citation will be preceded by asterisks, typically followed by dashes. Those dashes show that these are not complete words. Very seldom do we cite complete words in Proto-Indo-European because in a sense that's not all that useful. Uh, typically it is the root syllable or root two syllables that we're going to be interested in because descendant languages will form their own specific words from those roots with a lot of different formants. Those formants may themselves go back to Proto-Indo-European. So if they're suffixes, they'll actually start with a dash when we cite them in Proto-Indo-European. So for example, we might say, you know, the masculine nominative singular of an ostem noun in Proto-Indo-European, we might cite that as asterisk dash OS. But most of the time, we're not gonna be all that interested in the specific formations that make specific words in Proto-Indo-European, but rather the roots that give us the root vocabulary of descendant languages. So. Typically, these citations preceded by an asterisk, followed by a dash. All right, let's talk about a few other things. One of the most uh, perplexing and vexing issues about Proto-Indo-European studies are the class of sounds that we conventionally refer to as laryngeals. They might not actually have been laryngeals, and a lot of scholars disagree about what the exact meaning of these sounds were. But there were three of them that were somehow distinct. Conventionally, these are represented as H1, H2, H3. That is almost always how I'm going to represent them. And they can function as consonants or as vowels. I'm going to come back to that in just a second. Now, if we don't know which of the three to reconstruct, the convention that I follow, that I think most scholars today follow, is just write it as a capital H, indicating it's some laryngeal. We don't know if it was one, two, or three. Typically, the way that we reconstruct whether it was one, two, or three is by uh, coloring. So I'll come back to what coloring means in a moment. Uh, coloring can be most obvious in Greek. Um, in some ways, it is least obvious in a language like Sanskrit, which is otherwise extremely valuable for reconstructing Proto-Indo-European, because Sanskrit has some 
some vowels that collapse together. Uh, another place where we get uh, laryngeals, the most valuable attestation for them, is the Anatolian languages such as Hittite and Luwian, where we actually have laryngeals preserved as laryngeals, whatever the, exactly that means, some sound that's H-like. Um, in uh, writing done by speakers of those languages. Okay, so one other issue with laryngeals is that in non-Anatolian languages where laryngeals are not preserved as laryngeals, um, in a sense there's no reason to reconstruct the laryngeals for the last common ancestor of those languages, the non-Anatolian Indo-European languages. Now probably Anatolian split off before the other Indo-European languages, so there's some sense in reconstructing a ancestor to the non-Indo-European languages where uh, laryngeals are not present. But it can cause confusion as to what you mean by Proto-Indo-European. Do you mean the common ancestor of, um, just to take three languages from different branches as an example, Hittite, English, and Sanskrit? Or does it mean just the common ancestor of English and Sanskrit but not Hittite? So this can cause confusion. If you look at a really good reference work in Proto-Indo-European that's easily available, but I think underappreciated, probably underbought, um, that is uh, the American Heritage Dictionary of Indo-European Roots by Calvert Watkins. Wonderful scholar, wonderful man, uh, the late Calvert Watkins. The entries in bold that that dictionary is actually alphabetizing are the post-Hittite, post-Laryngeal Indo-European roots. Again, common ancestor of, say, English, Sanskrit, Latin, Greek, Russian, but not of Hittite. It has the laryngeals already gone, evidenced only by coloring. So let's look at what the difference is between um, those roots with laryngeals would be, and those roots without laryngeals would be. Let me just give you a quick word from my friends and partners at Grim Frost, and I'll come right back to talking about some specific roots and what they'll look like in those different citational forms. Okay, so for example, a root that I would usually cite as dh, dh being its own consonant in Proto-Indo-European, e, h1 showing the laryngeal number one, Watkins will cite as d with the long e. That's not coloring exactly, but what's happened is that after the laryngeal is lost and post-Anatolian Indo-European, um, it just lengthens the preceding vowel. H2, however, will color that E to A. So a root that I would normally cite as PE, P -E, laryngeal 2, uh, Watkins will cite as PA, P long A. You get that lengthening, but also you get coloring. H2 colors the E that it's adjacent to into an A. Same thing if it proceeds. So for example, a root that I would cite as HENT, laryngeal 2, E and T, Watkin cites as ant, the uh, ancestor of things like anterior. Uh, same way, dech, D-E, third laryngeal, Watkins will cite as do, uh, D long O. You get lengthening, you also get coloring. Uh, or uh, preceding the vowel hek, a root for C or I, like what I see with. Uh, Watkins will cite that as oak. So the coloring happens whether H2 or H3 proceeds or follows the E. Uh, the lengthening happens also if it follows the E. Now E is typically the vowel that we're going to cite any Proto-Indo-European root as having, even though Proto-Indo-European also has O. But it looks like the way Proto-Indo-European worked is that the, the template of the root in a way that might kind of remind you of a language like Hebrew, although working differently, the template of the root is the consonants that precede and follow the vowel. Now, those consonants may include laryngeals, of course. 
but the basic form of the root has the vowel e, so we call that full grade. There's also lengthened grade, where the e is long. Uh, this can happen uh, without comp compensatory lengthening, like what happens when you lose a laryngeal. There, there is also just long e in Proto-Indo-European. There's also O grade, where the e is replaced by an O. And then there's lengthened O grade, where it's a long O. And then there's zero grade, where the vowel is completely gone. Now, the alternations between these vowels, E, long E, O, long O, and no vowel, are called oblaut, and they are preserved in English strong verbs, as well as in a lot of other places throughout the Indo-European languages, but the most obvious place in English is, is in the strong verbs. So there's a root we can reconstruct as seng. That's the full grade. Lengthened E grade would be seng. O grade would be song. Length in O grade would be song, and then zero grade would be sung. Now, what's happening in sung in that zero grade is that the N itself, being a resonant, functions as a vowel. L, M, R, and N, so L and R, uh, resonance, sonorants, and then M, N, which are specifically called nasals, can function as vowels in Proto Indo European as they can in English. Right? So in English, words like, at least in American English, a word like um, earth, R is really the vowel. If there's no vowel preceding R, earth. Um, uh, pull, and a lot of people's pronunciations, including mine, the vowel is an L. Um, uh, something like button, the N at the end is really functioning as a vowel. Um, column. The M at the end is really functioning on its own as a vowel. Same thing can happen in Proto European, it very often does in zero grade. Now, in a Germanic language like English, those, those sonorants functioning as vowels get a preceding U, so you might notice that in the uh, forms of a strong verb in English like sing, what we've got sing, sang, sung is actually continuing the full grade, the O grade. A short O always becomes short A in a Germanic language, and then the zero grade. So English actually faithfully preserves as a quote-unquote irregularity something that was very regular in its proto-language about 5,000 years ago, or whatever exactly the time back to that is. All right, another thing to notice about how uh, Watkins might cite a form or other people might cite a form is Proto-Indo-European distinguishes so-called palatal velars from regular velars. That means that there's some kind of a distinction. It's probably something like g and k from just regular g and k. That g and k are represented by most writers with a kind of acute accent above them, but you'll sometimes see people use a circumflex accent above them um, if that's just what their you know keyboard allows. And then in some books like like, say, Watkins' dictionary, um, the main entries don't distinguish those palatal velars from the regular velars. You're just going to see G or K. So, for example, the root for, for acre or, or agro, uh, Watkins decides this agro. I would typically write this hegro with the G uh, indicating that it's palatal because that does make a difference in some descendant languages. Like, for example, in Sanskrit, those palatal velars are uh, still, they, they give you different results than the regular feelers. That's because Sanskrit, or say Avestan, or the Baltic and Slavic languages, these are so-called satim languages, where the palatal velars remain distinct from the regular velars, but the labiovelars, the qua and gua sounds, fall together with the regular velars, ka and ga. Uh, languages like English, Latin, Greek, are so-called kentum languages, where the palatal velars fall together with the regular velars, but the labial velars remain distinct. So uh, kya and ka fall together, but kwa remains distinct. So in a Germanic language like English, kya and ka from Proto-European both become ha, but kwa distinctively becomes hua. And of course, in most people speaking now, just a wa, or in other Germanic languages, typically just a va, and I sign a kwa. Uh, so those are called kentum versus satsum languages because you have um, Protoform, uh, Proto Indo European, kumptom, something like that. In Latin, that becomes kentum. 
right? The ch becomes a regular k, but in Avestan that becomes sa, that's a Satim language. So it's just named for the, the different outcomes of that hundred root in uh, Latin versus Avestan, Kensim versus Satim languages, respectively. Another thing to keep in mind, um, there is something called so-called s mobile, s mobile. This just means that the s that starts a root in Proto-European may be kind of, as far as we can tell, arbitrarily dropped in some branches or in some individual words and in individual branches. My favorite example of this is the root steg, which means cover. So English thatch is an exact uh, descendant of this root with uh, Grimm's Law, ta da tha, ga da ka, and then uh, palatalization, eventually affrication of ka da cha in some context in English. That is cognate with Latin toga, which is the same root in O grade, and uh, doesn't have the S also, but then the Greek stego roof does have the S mobile, so you get stegosaurus, right? The roofed lizard, the lizard with a roof on it, was how the plates on it were originally perceived. Other roots with S mobile include, for example, uh, snag, meaning snow. So English maintains the S. Latin nix, root niv, uh, does not maintain the S. The S just apparently is kind of arbitrarily lost. Or think of um, like uh, Czech slug, or something like slimak, slimak. Um, but in Latin or Greek, that's limox, lamox without the S. So S mobile, S is often written in apostrophes to indicate they may or may not show up in descendant languages words. Another thing to keep in mind is different ways people write I and U and their consonantal forms, Ya and Wa. I should have mentioned that these are also sonorants, resonants that can function as, um, well, they're, they're glides, but they can also, like the sonorants, that can function as vowels or as consonants. So, so the vowel e, written i, can also function as consonant ya. Usually today people write that in its consonantal form as a y, following English practice, just like people usually write the consonantal form of the vowel u as a w, following English practice. But you'll find some older writers who might write that consonantal i as a j, or as an i with an accent under it. Same thing, you'll find some writers who will write that uh, consonantal u, that w, as a um, as a u with an accent under it. So these are some of the things to watch out for in looking at reconstructed Proto-Indo-European words and roots as they will be cited in scholarly sources or in my YouTube videos. And uh, no doubt, other things that I've forgotten about, I have noted on the screen in text. I hope this has been somewhat useful to you. Uh, if it has been, I appreciate your support. Uh, of course, support in the form of buying books. I've translated a lot of important Norse myths and sagas in the original Old Norse forms into English. And also another probably principal way you can support this channel is via Patreon. So, and by the way, if you are on Patreon, you get to attend these live monthly interviews that uh, I do with Tony Yates about Indo-European news, as well as a lot of other interviews with great experts on different subjects and language myth and other things. And uh, you get stuff like a Christmas card, which maybe this will be posted before Christmas, so maybe you can still request one of those. All right, well, my ears are starting to freeze. Um, <laughs> but I've enjoyed the snowy background here, the snake. And uh, I'm wishing you well, wishing you all wonderful holiday seasons out there. And from beautiful Wyoming, please know I am as always wishing you all the best.